Good afternoon, and good to see you all again. Talk about something completely different. <laughs> Talk about women in the post-war South with you this afternoon. Um, this is a really broad topic, um, and um, I'm going to approach it a couple of different ways. Um, we'll begin the program by looking at a particular place and moment in time, uh, namely Richmond, Virginia, just after the end of the war for a really specific look at how black and white women fared in the aftermath of the Confederate evacuation and surrender of Richmond and the resumption of federal control of the city. And this will give us a sense of some of the challenges facing Southern women in the immediate post-war period and the various ways that they negotiated their dramatically different lives. Then we're gonna look into a more amorphous time frame, um, say roughly, 1865 through maybe even up as far as the 1880s because a lot of those trends kind of continue and then things change pretty dramatically by the 1890s. Um, so we're going to kind of leave off with that. Um, and we're going to look at this much more broad uh, way that um, issues such as race really shaped the way that women would experience those later post-war years. Um, because at the end of the American Civil War, Southern women faced a region completely devastated by numerous battles. The years after Confederate defeat were busy ones for women, as well as men, uh, as they negotiated really dramatic economic deprivation and social dislocation. Yet Southern women found that their wartime experiences promoted long-term changes in their worlds. As after most wars, such as World War II, there's a certain amount of pushback at the war's end for a return to normalcy, uh, a certain attempt to undo certain changes that were created by the war and to return to a certain status quo. But this is rarely, if, if ever, a complete return, um, especially as many of the people who experience something new are reluctant to give that up um, in, in the post-war period. Many Southern women attempted, and some achieved, uh, very different public and private lives than those that they had, had led before or even during the Civil War. And while they shared some experiences by virtue of their gender, location, or other circumstances, they ultimately lived very different lives from one another based on their education, class, but most importantly, their race. So after the evacuation fire of April 2nd and 3rd, 1865, here in Richmond, there were 900 homes and businesses, which was a full or partial 54 blocks that were destroyed. Um, gonna, oh, there we go. So all of the uh, blocks that are outlined in black are areas that were effectively uh, destroyed by the evacuation fire. For a reference point, I've got the map flipped upside down so that this is north and this is south. Um, and this is the Virginia State Capitol, and the museum and White House would be kind of up here-ish, but they're kind of off the map. So it's basically all of the commercial district, um, and right about here is the Tredegar Iron Works. Um, so that gives you, if, if you have some sense of Richmond, roughly the area that was <coughs> completely destroyed by the fire. So we're talking a city devastated, if not in, other, um, if not in utter chaos. Union Army officials placed the city under martial law. Permits were required to enter or leave the city, and they were only issued to those who took the oath of allegiance. Some Richmond residents believed that having a Yankee border would offer protection to their homes, property, or families, so they were very eager to take them in. Black and white women with some access to food often found ways to directly profit from Union soldiers with a longing for home cooking by making and selling food items. Many black women also made money by washing clothing for federal uh, soldiers. However, it wasn't long before basic concerns of shelter and food established themselves as the main concern for everyone. With Richmond surrounded by terrible roads and several destroyed bridges, and with only a few horses left in civilian hands, food rapidly became scarce within the city. 
the federal government did more to relieve Richmonders' sufferings than did municipal government. With thousands of destitute people begging for food at the provost marshal's office, union forces gave rations to freedmen, certified unionists, and anyone who had taken the loyalty oath. They also set up soup kitchens and distributed fuel and sometimes clothing. Uh, shelter would continue to be a big, a, a big concern. Um, this is a canal boat um, in Richmond, and I'm going to zoom in on this area here and get a closer look at m most notably the women who are living on board of this canal boat with things piled up like china cabinets and coverlets and maybe other belongings bundled up in, into some of these sorts of things. But basically, people are seeking shelter wherever they can find it. Given that the oath of allegiance was a prerequisite to receiving rations, many white Southerners professed that they took the oath only to get those rations and not because they genuinely welcomed the presence of the U.S. government. There was one popular story, don't know if it's entirely true or more apocryphal, uh, of a girl who refused to take the oath to receive rations because, quote, I never swore in all my life. But when she was told that she must take the oath to get rations, she, she replied, well, sir, if you say I must, then damn the Yankees, and <laughs> held her hand out for food. Many civilians still went hungry, as a staple of the Union commissary was Yankee salted cod, which was unusual to most Southern palates. As former Confederate nurse Phoebe Pember wrote, quote, few gently nurtured could relish such unfamiliar food. The federal commissary couldn't possibly feed all of the needy, so agents of the Christian Commission of the Army, the Sanitary Commission, and privately supported Northern humanitarian organizations set up various relief stations throughout the city. Public and private philanthropies were soon distributing food to thousands of people, um, and this often consisted of more palatable meat, meal, flour, and sometimes coffee, tea, and sugar. Soon there was a citizens committee appointed um, in, in Richmond to aid in distributing relief to the destitute. The committee consisted of a 70-member relief commission uh, under the supervision of one officer and two white Richmonders. They divided the city into 30 districts and appointed two or three prominent men from each district to basically help certify the needy cases within each of their neighborhoods. And then they were to distribute the food provided by the army. Um, when need was found, a ration ticket would, would, would be issued, uh, which entitled the bearer to pork, fish, or beef, and cornmeal or flour. In the 17 days from April 2nd to approximately the 20th, um, over 128,000 rash, um, rations were, were issued, or an average of 7,500 per day. By the end of April, 13,000 rations daily were being given to, to persons of both sexes and races. Efforts were made to prevent the, the distribution of free rations from becoming a, quote, permanent evil. And guidelines were soon developed to limit the number of people who were qualified to receive rations. By June, there were only 11,000 people on the relief rolls, drawing 39,000 rations a week, or about 5,500 daily. So that's down pretty dramatically just, just within a couple of months. The U.S. Army forced many of these people to work. Um, although demands for rations didn't really decline, some Richmonders chose to purchase loaves of government bread for six and a quarter cents rather than accept federal charity. General Ord's reports to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton gave a, a grim picture of an overcrowded city. Thousands of paroled soldiers from Appomattox were unable to get home. 26,000 people, quote, of all classes without money or food were present within the city. In addition to various northern tourists uh, and reporters, there were newly freed African Americans who were looking for relatives or to get a taste of city life, frightened white civilians from the surrounding countryside uh, who were searching for food, shelter, and safety, orphans with nowhere else to go who were begging and thieving to, to, to support themselves returning Confederate soldiers coming back to Richmond, and thousands of others passing through the city on their way home, as well as 10,000 Union soldiers stationed in and around the city. To help alleviate all of this crowding, uh, General Ord furnished transportation home for families who had refugeed in Richmond. To, to provide employment, he opened shops where women could work for the quartermaster department. 
Uh, and beginning on the last Monday in April, uh, it was declared that no marriage licenses would be issued unless an oath of allegiance to the United States was taken. So predictably, there was a big rush, a, a big rush of weddings during that, that last weekend. On May 2nd, the military governor of Virginia wrote to his brother-in-law, Ulysses Grant, quote, there is a starving multitude here. Some people did have money, but there was no food for them to buy. Uh, there were an estimated 20,000 newly freed African Americans within the city limits. By June 22nd, this had increased to over 30,000. Um, the military tried to remove as many uh, 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 of these people as they could. On May 3rd, the army stiffened its policy for keeping blacks out of the city. They began turning away anyone who was who was trying to come in, and they attempted to force those who were already there to go back to the countryside, um, in, in many cases uh, saying that, that black men's labor was needed to help produce crops. A very strict pass system was enacted, and this proved controversial because it seemed very similar to pass systems that had been in place before and during the war that, that, that regulated the free travel of African Americans, and this instilled a lack of trust in the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, often just called the Freedmen's Bureau. And there were camps such as these uh, that swelled around the edges of the city that were essentially uh, tent cities for these for these newly freed people. Just outside of Richmond, see if I can go back, um, you can actually see, I think this is the Virginia Capitol building right here. Throughout this early period of US Army presence, white women were often more outwardly defiant than, than white men. They were perhaps better able to get away with it by virtue of their gender. They might only go out in public uh, wearing layers of thick veils, or they would cross the street rather than walk beneath a US flag. Four-fifths of wealthy white Richmond women were, were wearing black morning clothing. Others were so destitute that all that they had were very refined clothes. Um, and, the, and the weather was notably warm. But there, were another, um, there were a number of white women who were seen going about in heavy fur coats because they had nothing else very respectable to wear. One tense situation which occurred between blacks and whites, which to a certain degree helps to illustrate the feelings of many white Southern women at that time, was that there was a house in Richmond on 22nd Street that was occupied as a headquarters for an African-American brigade. And quote, a fine looking colored man was posted as guard just outside uh, of, of this headquarters. While he was standing guard one day, three elite white women were walking down the road. Now the guard was under strict orders to walk his post close to the fence. But there was a city law that said that blacks must always pass on the curbside whenever there were white people walking by. When he refused to move, they refused to pass. And they turned around and went home, saying that they would go home and tell their father, and he would see if, if they could not walk the streets of, of Richmond without being stopped by a colored man. So there were these ways that black and white people were trying to, to feel out what, what the new rules were going to be. And it was complicated by the fact that women didn't have a very active political voice throughout all of this. But they were obviously you know, constituting roughly half of the population. So they're, they're very active in, in trying to help determine what these new rules are going to be. Um, these are photographs from the museum collection. And just to tell you a bit about each of the women who are shown here. Uh, here on the far left, this is a photo taken shortly after the war of a woman named Sarah Walker. And during the war years, she had worked in the White House of the Confederacy as a cook. And um, you can see here that she's dressed very well with this really lovely bonnet with feathers and things on it. Um, so she's, we unfortunately don't know much about what happened to her after the war, um, but she seems to have done very well. Um, this image here is a tin type. Um, this was donated to us um, about 20 years ago um, with a group of family papers that, that included two sales receipts for a slave woman named Bella. Um, now the family that purchased Bella had originally lived in South Carolina, but after the war they moved to Boston, Massachusetts. 
and went them, uh, and with them went one of their former slaves, uh, which the uh, later census data reveals uh, as an elderly black woman named Bella Jenkins. So we, we believe that this is a photo of Bella who chose, for whatever reasons, to, to stay with the family. Um, here in the upper corner here um, is a woman named Ellen Barnes McGinnis. During the war, she had been um, she had been a slave in the White House of the Confederacy and had worked as a nanny and a maid and apparently something of a close confidant to, to First Lady Verena Davis. Um, Ellen was a native of Richmond and she was apparently married during the war, but her husband ran away and was never heard from again. So after the war, um, I believe in 1867, she remarried and two guests to her wedding, which was down near Fortress Monroe, down near Hampton Roads, were the former First Lady of the Confederacy, Verena Davis, as well as the former uh, housekeeper in the White House during the war, who was an Irish immigrant. Um, so these two white women went to Ellen's wedding, which kind of bespeaks of a certain closeness amongst them all. Um, and Ellen and her new husband then moved to Baltimore. Um, and finally, this image down here um, was taken in 1866 or 67. And unfortunately, we don't know the identity of the African-American woman. We do know that the white baby that she's holding is named Roberta Lee Serganor, and she was born in 1866, so that helps us to, to date the photo a little bit. They were living in Monroe, Louisiana, and um, we believe that the, woman, that the woman was probably serving as her nursemaid. Um, but several of these um, images um, and stories of these women helped to illustrate kind of the complicated lives and choices that they had to make in the post-war period. Um, the Civil War and Reconstruction, I'm sorry, yes? Uh, Ellen Barnes McGinnis, M-A-G-I-N-N-I-S. McGinnis. The Civil War and Reconstruction periods provided African Americans with a legal definition of citizenship as expressed in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, the transition from enslavement to freedom was a difficult and frightening one for many of them. Being generally very poor, with limited or no education, and very little access to it, they were confronting systemic racism, and these former slaves were under no illusions that postbellum America promised a new life of freedom with the same rights provided to other American citizens, much as they would hope for this. It was in the post-war period that many black women encountered their hardest fights in the battle for self-determination. Freed women attempted to, to remain physically safe and to define their, their freedom by actively shaping the nature of their labor, their domestic environments, and their relationships with other Southerners and with government officials. Yet every interaction with other people or the government hinged upon their gender and race. Freedmen's Bureau policies, particularly at the local level, were shaped by Northern assumptions about the ideal dependent domestic woman and her free labor. Black women, in turn, use the Bureau to pursue their own objectives, such as getting material relief or finding legal justice or getting their children out of abusive versions of various apprenticeships. To foster reconstruction, the Bureau encouraged black women and men to enter into marriage and into labor contracts, sometimes with their former white masters. Um, but this, perhaps unsurprisingly, didn't always work out for the best, as particularly the labor contracts often proved to have um, lots of regulations and things that were not at all preferential to, to African Americans. Um, and many times the marriage contracts were with people that they felt ultimately rushed into marrying and not ultimately those that they would, um, would have perhaps chosen in the long term. Perhaps the most remarkable accomplishment of the Bureau was in the field of education. As a federal agency, it established 4,500 schools throughout the South for newly freed slaves thirsty for knowledge. The attendance rates were amazingly high. By 1865, more than 90,000 former slaves were enrolled as students. Women as well as men and children flocked to these new public schools to learn the alphabet and to acquire useful and marketable skills, such as sewing for women. Most of these schools were unable to survive after the Bureau was disbanded in 1872 
Yet some of those that did evolved into well-known colleges and universities, some of which do survive today, such as Howard University. As occurred in Richmond in the weeks that followed the end of the war, ex-slaves flocked to cities such as Atlanta and Chattanooga in search of defining their, their newfound freedom through workplace resistance, the exercise of political rights, and building institutions such as stores, restaurants, churches, schools, benevolent societies, and political organizations. Many black women, given their preference, did not want to live in isolation on plantations, but they wanted to, to see what city life was about. They wanted to try some sort of employment of a different sort than perhaps what they had experienced before. Or perhaps they were simply looking for long lost relatives. In other cases, particularly for older women or for those with large families of young children, they may have felt safer or more comfortable staying with what was familiar. And this often meant remaining on plantations or in households with their former owners. There were certainly many people who, who, who tried one path and then ultimately took another as the contours of their new lives became known. Employment was a particularly difficult negotiation for freed women. If they remained with their former owners, whether by choice or by necessity, they often faced the very difficult task of establishing boundaries with individuals who had previously owned them. Even as something as fundamental as establishing their own household away from their former master's home or plantation, or determining precisely which tasks that they would be responsible for and those that they weren't, um, would, would prove exceedingly difficult. Yet this sort of separation and establishment of a separate identity was hugely important to black women who had rarely been given the opportunity to create their own homes and families before or to dictate their own schedules. One tactic of resistance that black women uh, household workers could use to control their labor was simply to, to quit. Um, so if they weren't bound by a, a particular legal agreement, then they would just simply say, I'm not going to put up with this and walk away thus depriving their employers of complete power over, over the terms of their labor. A few more images of some post-war white women from our collection. Um, here in the lower corner, we have Verena Davis, shown with her husband Jefferson Davis in a photo taken just a few years after the war's end. Um, she helped him organize and write his very extensive memoir of the Confederacy. And uh, after his death, she was recruited by Kate Davis Pulitzer, who was no relation, to write articles and eventually a regular column for, for one of Joseph Pulitzer's newspapers, the New York World. Um, so she became a very well-known and rather, um, rather readable sort of writer. Um, this young woman here is Roxana Smith Johnson. Um, she was a sister to a soldier who was killed at the Battle of Chancellorsville and I believe was also married to a Confederate soldier who survived the war. Um, and this photo was taken about 1875 when she would have been um, in her mid-30s. And we don't know that she was specifically involved in Confederate memorial activities, but that would not have been at all unusual for someone with, with her family connections. Um, this lady here is Mary Duren from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, her husband died in 1880, and he had been trying to publish um, colonial laws for many years, but uh, had not succeeded before his death. So she took up the torch with that after his passing and managed to have several volumes published. Um, and then following that project, she became a, a noted collector of uh, Civil War relics and documents, and many of those have actually made their way into our own collection. Um, and this woman here in the upper corner is Mary Cobb Johnson. Uh, she was the sister of several Confederate soldiers, and she served as the president of the Ladies Memorial Association of Atlanta for 12 years. She had the bodies of 2,000 Confederate soldiers removed from battlefields around Atlanta at her own expense and reburied in one centralized cemetery. Um, and she also worked to get headstones uh, on all of the graves of the Confederate un unknowns there. The war which killed or maimed many potential marriage partners helped create large numbers of Southern white women who never married or who once widowed um, chose never to, to select another partner. 
Um, some of these women chose to remain single uh, rather than enter into non-companionate marriages, and others just simply never had the opportunity. Uh, but this meant that there was uh, kind of a, a new thing occurring throughout the South of many, many white women who were unmarried, and uh, this was something of a, of a cultural revolution, um, and something had to be done for all of them, because if nothing else, um, their families couldn't, couldn't really support all of them. Um, and whether married or single, the Reconstruction period saw many more white women turning to paid work outside of the home than ever before, particularly young women who were generally committed to these sorts of things as more of a, of a long-term career. Teaching was one particular area that really opened up uh, to white women for paid work, and to a lesser extent, such professions as writing, clerical work, art school, clerking in a store, or even medicine, as, as women began to, to pursue uh, nursing as a, as a trained profession, or even becoming doctors in some cases. Uh, school, school teaching became a premier symbol of genteel women in the workplace. Not only did it offer pay, an intellectual life, a measure of authority, but it also gave women a chance to educate children, to feel that they were contributing something to the wider world, and to regain a certain amount of respect and honor. Um, this image is actually taken back in the garden behind the White House of the Confederacy. The, the White House, as you probably know, became the central school, one of the first public schools in, in Richmond at the end of the war. And uh, this photo was taken in 1871 or two, um, and you can notice a few uh, women seated throughout who are, who are the teachers, as well as I believe this is the male president, either this fellow or this fellow. Um, and this is a photo from our collection as well of um, a woman who taught just a few years after the uh, school photo was taken, who was, who was one of the teachers um, within the house. Um, so although being a teacher offered a lot of uh, tangible benefits to these women, the South was largely unused to the idea of independent women working outside of the home and in public. Um, and teachers, perhaps by the fact that there were so many of them, most directly challenged the domestic ideal of dependent women staying at home and relying on men to, to um, to basically pay for everything uh, and to serve as, as the public face of the family. To be sure, most of these uh, white women teachers were not rebels. Uh, most felt it was their, their duty to inculcate civic and religious ideals in young people, and they taught pupils to respect authority. Yet their very presence uh, and, and existence in public posited a role for women outside of the family uh, and expanded the possibilities of female education, autonomy, and authority. Some women found a, a greater civic role. Middle-aged white women led the way in the creation of sanitized cemeteries for fallen Confederate soldiers, many of whom had been their brothers, husbands, or suitors. Union burial efforts focused only on Union soldiers. Um, so in places such as Cold Harbor, um, the Confederate dead were almost literally lying on the ground for anyone to find. In other cases, there were farmers who would be plowing a field and they would find one or two bodies um, as, as they were going about their, their work um, and, and disturbing unmarked graves. In either case, Southern white women found this a terrible situation and began forming ladies' memorial associations whose aim was to relocate the Confederate dead and the occasional federal dead um, into centralized cemeteries and to commemorate their sacrifices. As many as 100 of these organizations may have formed throughout the South. Uh, Nora Fontaine Maury Davidson, who was actually a school teacher during and after the war, um, is believed to have begun perhaps the very first Decoration Day, which later became known as Memorial Day. And I'm going to zoom in on this photo a little bit here. It's not the best photo, so we'll zoom in on this section a bit to take a closer look at some of the women. Um, this photo, we believe, was taken in June of 1865 on the very first Decoration Day, which commemorated 125 soldiers who had died defending Petersburg one year earlier. Um, Miss Davidson t uh, ended up teaching school for almost 60 years in Petersburg during and after the war um, and uh, helped to, to spread this idea of caring for the Confederate dead. Uh, the annual Southern tradition of decorating graves, which became known as Decoration Day, 
uh, soon spread all throughout the country. And women would typically make floral arrangements and place them on graves. Um, they, they might arrange some sort of public program uh, or even organize the labor of men and boys for the more physically demanding tasks around the cemetery. This soon expanded to larger commemorative efforts, such as building monuments and memorials. So those of you who have been to Hollywood and seen the, the Confederate Pyramid, that is a direct out, uh, out, outgrowth of, of this impetus. Uh, by the 1890s, these groups had largely completed their, um, their original uh, efforts, and then they and they then turned to other projects, uh, such as creating the parent organization of this museum, the Confederate Memorial Literary Society. So the, many of the same women who had been involved with Hollywood Cemetery uh, then became directly responsible with gathering artifacts and documents, um, and telling the stories of soldiers, both living and dead, uh, who had fought in the war. Aside from memorial organizations. Many white women were active in church organizations, benevolent societies, and various kinds of activism. So they might be interested in assisting unwed mothers, or the temperance movement, uh, or, or, or in promoting women's education. There was certainly a lot of domestic upheaval in the immediate post-war period, as white women negotiated new relationships with their former slaves, uh, and new ways of dealing with housework in the absence of, of so many uh, helpers about the home. It was a new world where, ser where servants could quit, and even privileged women had to increase their knowledge of domestic affairs. While many older women may have felt overwhelmed by these tasks and depressed at the, uh, uh, at the dramatic changes in their lives, younger women seemed to have embraced these challenges more readily, seeing the task of learning to operate an oven and prepare a meal as something of an adventure. Yet most white women had little problem with making demands on their, Afri uh, on their African American servants and workers. The nature of 19th century Southern politics influenced white women's relative lack of interest in it. Politics had inherently generally been very rowdy and masculine in nature, and men often opposed the sorts of programs that women were advocating. So you can see why a lot of men would perhaps not be, be strong proponents of the temperance movement. Uh, the old antebellum link between suffrage and abolition had long made uh, political action really unacceptable to, to southern white women, and this continued a certain connection with women's rights with various um, invasive northern ideas. Um, so politics continued to kind of be a bit off limits, strictly speaking, but women did find lots of non-political forms of action as the best ways to, to accomplish their goals. In conclusion, there was no single experience for women in the post-war period. Much depended on their age, specific location, educational background, family circumstances, and most importantly, their class and race. Yet far from the post-war years being a direct retreat to antebellum ideals and ways of life, most women embraced the social and cultural transformations that the war had wrought and looked for ways to grow and change with them. Thank you. Any questions about all of that? I know it was a very broad overview. Um, I do have my email address here if you have any questions about any of this or any flag questions as well. Um, and then on the next slide, I do have a few books that I would recommend for additional reading on this topic. Um, there has been a lot written and more continues to be written these days than, than ever um, on, on this topic, particularly on the topic of, of African-American women in the post-war period. Um, the way that scholarship is kind of going right now, there's very much a look at generational ways of looking at the war. So noticing that you know, younger women had different responses to things than older women, um, that rural people had different responses sometimes than urban women. Um, but a lot of scholarship now is very much looking at before, during, and after the war to really chart a sense of how things changed over time. Um, so it's becoming increasingly um, rare to find a book that only focuses on the post-war period or only on the antebellum period, but really looking at the whole spectrum of it to, to really get a sense of change over time, which, which has proved really helpful for a lot of these. So here's some of the books I would recommend. Um, the first two, despite being a bit old, um, are still some of the best works on African American women's experiences in the post-war period and that, that transition. 
Um, and then the bottom three are more focused on white women. Uh, the fourth one is really more about the ladies' memorial associations and, and reburying the dead. Um, and um, taken together, these would be probably a good um, college level sort of history course reading kind of thing. But any one of these has lots of really good specific examples of how black and white women were, were, were moving forward with, with things in the post-war period. All right, any questions? Yes. There is a little bit, but it's very difficult to find sources. So there tends to be much less written about it because it's harder to find evidence for it. Um, we do know that they were less likely to get into paid positions such as teaching because they weren't as well educated. Um, so they would be more likely to, to move to, to big cities and take up factory work, uh, which certainly became something that was much more common. Uh, at, I'm sorry? Um, more f of poor women moving from rural areas into cities, uh, particularly down in places like North Carolina and Georgia that became really well known for their textile production. They would, they would really start working in large numbers on a lot of those. And often this meant moving away from families and living in basically big dormitories with lots of other women. Uh, but this often proved very liberating for them um, because they were uh, far away from their parents and they were around lots of other young people and so this this could be very liberating for for lots of them or they might find um, a young man who worked at that factory or some other nearby factory and end up living in the city after that um, so there definitely was a certain measure of people kind of moving to the cities for various economic opportunities um, we also should say that there were a lot of women rich and poor um, black and white who ended up moving west during during this period, uh, who wanted to, to get away from the South and away from the, the, the economic deprivation and who wanted to take advantage of things like the Homestead Act and claim property out, uh, out West. So th this could be in the Midwest, it could be out in the Far West, um, but there were lots of people who were, who were you know, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s who were just moving as far away from the South as they possibly could in search of different economic opportunities. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you all very much.